This is an air source heat pump. <laughs> It's a 13 kilowatt Grant air source heat pump. I can tell you everything that you need to know. It's renewable energy, so you're going to lower your carbon footprint, and that's going to obviously be better for the environment. So if you're green-minded and you're looking for future heating technologies, this is going to be the best option for you. There's the air source, there's also ground source as well. Obviously, this is generating uh, its heat from the ambient air. So the way that this works would be it's going to drag it's got a fat two fans at the front. This is a twin fan unit. So you can get single fan units, which would be this high, but it's going to drag through the fan, through the back of the evaporator here, pull through and generate from the ambient air temperature. It's going to upcycle that energy that's in the air to a heat, which is then going to provide comfortable room temperatures if it's installed correctly, which is where heat pumps can get a bad name because if they're not installed correctly, that's when you can have high running costs. That's when you have heat pumps that don't last as long as they should do. A big, quite important thing about heat pumps is the design of them, making sure that's bang on to begin with because they don't work in the same way a gas boiler does. They, they work at a low temperature. When I say low temperature, so the output of the unit, really, if you want really maximum efficiency, it needs to be working at around 35 de uh, degrees or 40 degrees. So that's how hot a radiator would physically get to touch or if you had an underfloor system you know that you get underfloor quite common be 35 degrees under there as well that's where you're going to get the maximum efficiency out of the unit if you try and get higher temperatures out of this let's say you want the same temperatures that a gas boiler would uh, give you around 70 80 degrees then that's good the efficiency of that's going to drop off a cliff and you're going to be paying a lot on your on your electric bills whether these are a viable alternative for you or not is kind of working out and it's at the design phase to figure out your annual running costs so if you're on a tariff you'll know that your electric will be more expensive than your gas so you need to obviously design these in a way where your the efficiency of the unit is at least gonna be at even par with a fossil fuel but it's a renewable source so it's not just about cost savings it's about having something which is which is green and in over a period of time if you wanted to add solar if you wanted to improve the insulation of your building of where you live you know you can save money there in in the longer term but it is kind of a long-term investment in a lot of cases that we go to it's not overly practical for people to invest large amounts of money into an air source heat pump if they've got a gas boiler on the wall because they could replace a gas boiler from as little as 1600 quid you can replace a gas boiler for for this that's not going to cover the cost of the unit you know, you're looking at an investment of between 10 to 15,000 pounds, depending on what's required. You're not going to be able to just swap an air source heat pump for a gas boiler. We're going to have to design the, the system correctly and appropriately to ensure that the emitters, which are your radiators, your underfloor, are going to be suitable to work at a lower temperature, at a lower output, which is again, like I said earlier, that's where you get your efficiency out of this. So this system is a 13 kilowatt grant. I've designed the flow temperature, so that's like the maximum uh, flow temperature which will, I will get around my radiators inside this property to be 40 degrees okay the boiler that we took out of here was operating around 75 degrees okay so it's you know near enough 50 percent lower than it was previously which meant we've changed every single radiator in this house and we've upgraded pipe work for this to flow nicely and to get the efficiency so this will give me based on my design, around 500% efficiency. And it's called a SCOP, your seasonal coefficient of performance. Whereas on a gas boiler, you're looking at around 90 to 95% efficiency. So for every one kilowatt of gas, you're getting obviously 0.95 kilowatts out of it. And that's at best, best case. The risk is, like I've already referred to, is not designing these correctly and not putting them in and, and not doing the, the right design calcs. Off the back of here, we've got our pipe work, our primary pipe work that needs to be able to carry water around the system faster than a gas boiler. And that's called something called DT. So it's your differential between what goes out and what comes back on your pipe work. DT could also be described of the DT, uh, the difference between your outdoor temperature and your internal temperature. So that's your difference. A gas boiler would operate, uh, if it's a condensing appliance, with a DT of around 20, which is if the Water's going out at 70 degrees, it's coming back at 50 degrees. So there's a 20 degree difference there. Now on this heat pump, we design it to a degree, uh, a DT of five degrees, which is quite a difference, isn't it? So if it's going out and it will be going out on this system at 40 degrees maximum, the return temperature of the water coming back to the heat pump is around 35 degrees. 
So that means that the water flowing around my system here is moving a lot quicker, okay? This is why your pipe work's important because if your pipe works tight and it's undersized, this is gonna be turning on and off like the clappers. It's not gonna stay on and, and run low and slow, which is what we need it to do, again, to get the efficiencies out of it. We want this to be lasting 15, 20 years. We don't wanna be putting it on and it be turning on and off, damaging the compressor. It's a, it's a sizable investment that needs to be done and installed correctly. Another good thing about heat pumps as well, which is available on gas boilers, um, is the controls that you set it up to, and it's got weather compensation built actually into this unit. So I've already referenced that the flow temperature of this system, the maximum temperature is 40 degrees. This heat pump will give me that 40 degrees around my radiators if it's minus three out, and that's again back to your design. If it's a more mild temperature, mild day, I've got weather compensation to account for it being more mild externally, which will then drop that flow temperature from 40 on this system all the way down to 30 degrees. So it will operate at a much lower temperature, again, getting you more efficiency when it is more mild because it's working more intelligently. It's picking up on the air temperature here on a day like today when it's around 13, 14 degrees. It doesn't need to give the radiators 40 degrees worth of heat. It can actually drop that down and again, improve efficiency further. Sounds quite a big thing with these. It's quite a common thing really. Oh, you know, they're really, really noisy. So on a, on a survey, you would um, measure how far it is from the nearest habitable room, like a neighbor. And then there's actually a, there's a proper process and you like take into account whether it can be sited in a location or not, depending on obviously where you propose to put it to where your neighbor is and a habitable room is. There's a specific survey that we do just for that alone. It's kind of a common concern with people, but I don't feel that they're actually half as loud as people try to insinuate they are when, again, when they're installed correctly. And we have to install it to MCS standards, which is what we're accredited as as a business to install renewable technologies. We're also on some rubber feet here as well. So obviously these little elements are just to try and take some of the, the sound uh, out of the unit. If you just had it stood on, stood on concrete, that is gonna make a, make a bit of sound. It's also on flexible connections at the back, again, to give it that little bit of movement there because when it is on, it's obviously a moving part. It does generate some sound, but we need to mitigate that as best as possible by putting it in the right place and also obviously doing it to manufacturing instructions, putting on a rubber feet, flexible hoses, and again, installing it correctly. In regards to the heat pump, we can't just plonk this in and expect it to run and replace a gas boiler or, or something else. We usually have to make upgrades to the system. That's quite common. Uh, radiator upgrades, pipe work upgrades, new hot water cylinder. If we go inside, I can show you the space that you may need available and some of the equipment that we've installed at this property. Okay, so inside the property, um, there's a fair amount going on behind me. A little bit of a disclaimer as well. This is a work in progress at my own property. So there's a couple of uh, pipe works if you're a keen plumber, um, where you'll notice I've not got my PRV connections finished off yet, which like I said, is a work in progress. But to give you an idea of what you're gonna need space-wise available, this is, a, this is a pretty good setup. There are some variations where we can minimize the space required which I'll go on to shortly. But just to talk you through the setup that I've currently got here in this garage space is we've got a domestic hot water cylinder here. This is a heat pump ready hot water cylinder. So it's not a standard unvented cylinder. What that basically means is it's got more surface area inside the cylinder. So if you notice my flow and return here, all of this is to be insulated by the way, um, we've got a huge coil. So it's probably twice the size of what an ordinary indirect hot water cylinder is, um, and that is transferring the heat to the energy of the water that's inside, which is gonna give us our hot water. Um, so we need space for this, of course, and that needs to be appropriately sized for the home. Um, we've got, I believe it's a 300 litre cylinder here. So it's, sorry, 250 litre cylinder here. That's designed on the amount of rooms in the house and amount of occupants inside the house. Generally, you look at 45 litres uh, of hot water you need for um, each room. So if it's a four bedroom pop property, 45 litres per bedroom, plus one extra lot of 45 litres. Uh, in your master bedroom, you tend to have two people. So that's always been the general rule of thumb that I've worked to in regards to designing the hot water requirements based on your property. So it's 45 litres per bedroom and an extra lot of 45 litres uh, for the master bedroom, add them all together. That should really give you the literage of hot water you need for your property. So as I said, that's a, that's a heat pump ready unvented cylinder. 
Moving on to the pipe work, we've got some spaceship looking things here. That's what customers tend to call these. It's called an expansion vessel. This red one is relating to the heating system. Okay, so that's a heating expansion vessel. And the white one here is regulating the pressure and the hot water cylinder. It's very important. It's a common um, thing that we come across. These don't get serviced uh, on an annual basis. And this is uh, for gas boiler systems and also for heat pump systems. It's very important. These are getting serviced annually, just like a gas boiler, just like a heat pump. And at this point on our services at Glow, we would be servicing these and making sure they've got the correct air pressures inside of them, which are set on the data badge. So if you want to check out the data badge, it will tell you what pressure you should have inside of these. So um, check them out. And if they're feeling really, really heavy on a wall, it's quite common they're falling off because they're full of water which is more reason why they need to be checked and done on an annual service. As I was saying, you've got two expansion vessels up here, a uh, central heating one, which is usually red, can be blue sometimes as well. And this is your potable hot water expansion vessel, which uh, most occasions is white like it is there. This wouldn't work on a, on a hot water cylinder. Okay, so it needs to be the correct expansion vessel on the correct part of the system which is when you would get an expert business in like ourselves to obviously make sure that's all running smoothly and it's obviously being installed correctly. On this hot water cylinder as well, it's worth mentioning that um, we've got a secondary hot water pump. So this is to minimize the dead legs that we have on the system. So with this uh, cylinder being fitted in the garage, we've got a pump here, which is circulating the hot water. So it's essentially got a loop. So rather than it taking 20, 30 seconds uh, to get hot water at the kitchen sink, we've got you know, a draw off, which is going to be uh, a few seconds. So yeah, secondary hot water pump, if you've got a large property, it really is worth worthwhile in installing that and extra pipe work to minimize dead legs. And also there's legionnaires to think about as well in regards to the safety of uh, any uh, hot water around the home. What you might notice as well is the size of the pipe work if you're, if you're eager eyed. Um, you can see the old, uh, the old gas boiler was fitted here and our pipe work went up through the roof. We've actually installed new primaries and these primaries are our flow and return from the heating system. They're 28 mil in diameter. Ordinarily, what's most common in domestic homes is these pipes are 22 mil and that's what they were in this property before. So we have ran new 28 mil copper pipes through the main primary pipe work in the house to ensure that we get that flow that I was talking about through the system. So we really are looking for a tight DT here. So that means water's moving through the system a lot faster. So we need to make sure these are sized correctly so we don't get excessive noise. Um, and also again, so we're getting the efficiency out of the heat pump. We want this heat pump to stay on low and slow for a long period of time. We want that compressor to have as minimal startups as possible. So we're gaining the efficiency out of it. And you can only do that by having appropriately sized radiators and pipe work to make sure you know it's running it's running nice and efficiently. So in this video, we spoke a little bit about potential upgrades to the heating system. Quite a common one is upgrading of radiators. I've already mentioned that pipe work may need upsizing, um, but I wanted to just give you an example of potential radiator upgrades that would be required, which are worth thinking about when going down this route of thinking about heat pumps. I've got two radiators here. One is called a K3 radiator and one's a K2. So as you can see, this one on my left is K3, it's quite, it's quite thick. Um, so consideration really is gonna be needed in regards to the wall space you've got available. Um, and also obviously whether you can actually carry, uh, carry the weight on these. This is why sometimes heat pump isn't always a great option, simply if there isn't the wall space in a property. So K3s tend to be fitted where you are limited on wall space, but you are obviously increasing the, the width of the radiator. On my right here, we've got a standard K2 radiator. This is very standard, so I'd be surprised if you didn't already have one of these in your property. Um, and then there is a K1, a single panel, which, which you're gonna have in your property. To put it simply, uh, because a heat pump works at a lower output, at a lower temperature, and that's how you get the most efficiency out of it, we're having to increase the surface area of the radiator to something like this, where there is more surface area, there's more output available for it to work at a lower temperature while still ensuring we've got comfortable room temperatures. Again, this is why design's important. This is why we have to spend time on site, making sure we're giving you the best options to maximize how that heat pump's gonna work most effectively. So just a quick little demonstration there of the difference between a K3 triple radiator and a K2 double radiator, and really just the, 
the key differences there. So we've got to think about the electrical system as well. So with the heat pump, it is going to be drawing more electricity from the grid, um, which will mean you will need to route, obviously, some of this uh, electrical cables here back to your consumer unit. So that, in some cases, can be problematic in regards to the run that you've got to uh, put in. That being said, there's no way around it. We need to get power to where we need it. Um, and we also need to do a DNO application to the local local ne electrical network um, to make sure that the property is okay um, to have a heat pump installed. At this point, you'd be assessing the electric meter itself, checking the amperage there to make sure that it's fit for purpose as well as filling in your application. A couple of other things that you may have noticed whilst you've been watching me is we've got a, a, a water softener here. Highly recommend in hard water areas. It's going to um, improve the wear and tear on you know, taps and things like that. Get nice soft water as well. A lot of benefits to that. Really, really easy systems to install. And this one's working nicely here. If I look and move over just to this side, we've got this um, this vessel, um, which I'm using as a volumizer without getting too complicated about it. This is providing flow um, and additional volume to the system. And what it means is this heat pump that's at the rear of the property here is going to stay on the longer and it's going to have the flow so it's going to be able to dissipate the the heat around the system if i didn't have this and i've got thermostatic radiator valves on on every radiator at the property i'd be decreasing the volume in the system therefore that heat pump out there could short cycle a lot more which again is not great for the heat pump so the way that i've installed this is all the water that's coming back from the central heating system which if you follow this blue lever valve down is returning water and it's going to return into this volume of water, which is 50 litres in here, I believe, and then back to the heat pump. So if all my radiators do close down, I've still got a volume of water here where the flow on the heat pump outside is still there and not do too much damage to the heat pump, essentially. There are other ways of uh, installing this. This could be installed as something called a buffer, if you've heard of that, you've done any research before. Um, and that would ordinarily work where you would have something called hydronic separation. So that may look slightly different you'd have two pipes going in one side and you'd have another two pipes coming out the other side and it would mean an additional secondary pump this side, okay? But I'm using the pump, the central heating pump that's inside the heat pump as opposed to installing another um, secondary heat pump. So you can install, um, install these either as a volumizer or a buffer. They don't always have to be separate to the cylinder. So if I move back over to the cylinder, there are some cylinders out there where this volumizer, and one, when I keep talking about it, we're talking about volume when we're talking, talking about adding additional capacity and volume to the system, can sit at the bottom of the tank and it will be separate from your hot water. If you um, was installing this in an airing cupboard, that's a really good option because you're going to save space. And this is one of the challenges when you're looking at installing a heat pump and in, obviously installing the hot water cylinder because you need to do it because it's going to run off your heat pump. You need to maximize the space that you've got sometimes. On them occasions, we would install this volumizer underneath the tank to, to maximize the space we've got available. Um, because as you can see, there's a lot going on here and uh, it's important that you know, we're mindful and we're finding the best solution for your home. If you've got space and you can put it in a garage like this, then that makes a lot of sense as well from a maintenance perspective as much as anything, but also in meaning that we can install the appropriate gear in the best way again, to maximize the efficiency at the heat pump. So if you're gonna start looking at costs with ourselves, we're looking around 10,000 pounds to 15,000 pounds for installation of a heat pump, because very, very simply, it's not just a heat pump that we're installing. We're gonna be looking at the central heating system as a whole. We're not a business which are gonna be installing something which isn't gonna be fit for purpose, isn't gonna have longevity. We're gonna have a heat pump that's gonna be installed in the best possible way. So that's why there's quite a variation of costs. The heat pumps are, are expensive, um, more expensive than a gas boiler in comparison. There's a lot of more design um, to make sure we get this right. There are a lot of benefits to installing a, a heat pump, whether it's right for you in your home, in your property, there's a lot to be discussed there. We're more than open to discussing this with you and having a chat about your requirements. If you want to find out more, please feel free to contact the team on our office number or visit our website and register your interest and we'll um, be able to talk to you a little bit more about it. Thank you.